Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to, <laughs> I guess it's Wednesday's Live at this point. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, today, the theme is uh, hints, glints, and squints. And hi, Carol. It's pretty much going to be about uh, the situations where we're dealing with a lack of color and backlighting, uh, what contrajour is sometimes called. Uh, the light is coming more or less in this image from the uh, uh, that end, or maybe even a little bit, probably a little bit above, actually. So everything is more or less in a silhouette. And the thing of that, uh, it favors watercolor. Watercolor, hi, Jen. Um, watercolor likes dark on light and strong contrasts and discernible contrasts. Um, it gets some power from that. And silhouettes, shapes, uh, almost more than color, have power. Um, something with a strong silhouette, when you come into a room full of pictures, your eye is going to jump to that first before it moves on to the ones with color. Um, and it particularly suits this approach um, to urban settings uh, because you have a lot of neutral colors, concrete, uh, stone, um, metal. Uh, people don't wear colorful clothing anymore. Everybody more or less wears <laughs> black or gray, um, maybe some white. Uh, so it really suits that. And it also suits uh, something where you want to suggest mood or uh, uh, that sort of thing. So at the same time, that doesn't mean we have to be uncolorful. Uh, one of the things that watercolor does beautifully is, is when it's wet, the, if you have more than one pigment in the, in the mix, uh, they will separate and create that lovely quality that, that only watercolor has. Um, other, other mediums won't do that. So we can do that within these dark shapes by maintaining a more or less consistent value but letting the hue separate and do interesting things. So that's how the color interest in something like this works, as opposed to a subject where you're just sort of running the color gamut. So you can see I've got what looks like a dirty palette here. Um, I like to leave that on there because when you need neutral colors, and particularly for a thing like this, this is actually really good. The only time you need like a super clean area, uh, such as that is when you have, I don't know, you need to put in a very clean yellow or a very clean particular color to, uh, before it gets dirtied up with something else. So Just to give you an idea of how you can get some power and some mood into it, I'm going to show you a couple examples, oil paintings, but that do it. Hi, Becky. Here are some works by uh, Peter Wildman, a British painter. Um, these are oils, like I say, uh, View of the Grand Canal in Venice. You can see he's got one long, large, strong silhouetted shape. There's not a whole lot of uh, color range in this, but within the buildings going down the canal there, there's variations. There's purples, there's grays, there's blues, there's umbers. And here's a, a maybe a slightly more high chroma version of, uh, I think the Avon River in Devon. Uh, it, you can see there's, there's power and mood, even though there isn't like a fruit salad's worth of, of, of color. So we're going to try and get something like that today. So this is uh, along the side of the Seine, there's uh, Notre Dame. These uh, items here are called uh, 
bouquinists, they, they open up into these book stalls. And I think these are probably the same. I found this photo online. I think these are the same ones because um, there's Notre Dame. So uh, this is what uh, they look like uh, when they're open and they sell used books and prints and posters and just all kinds of stuff. Uh, this particular day when I was there, uh, they were open on the other side, but they, they weren't open on this side. But they make a wonderful, strong shape. So the draw in this, um, that's <laughs> slipping in a little bit of perspective on you. First thing we look for, where are these key horizontals or these key verticals? And that's a key horizontal, the road. We're kind of going uphill there. And it does, I know it happens to be about dead center. So I'm just going to uh, make a mark there. Um, almost to center is where all these buildings end. That's a helps me out there. Um, this, the top of that is to there. The top of this is a little lower. Almost the same height. And where is this? Again, this is just maybe a little bit above the halfway point. Maybe that's a little bit below the halfway point. So now, how do we get this all right? Might be easiest to find the road. So look where this hits that. Uh, and if you can see it, you've got like a little wedge of a triangle there. So the, these don't have to be final. Um, and then I haven't mentioned it for quite a while, but because we haven't really dealt with the architecture subject, instead of worrying about all that theory, just use what I call the two pencil method. Um, get the bottom and get the top and then see what that is. And that sort of fixes it in your eye. Get the bottom, get the top. Where does this come? Again, that's about the almost the halfway point. This is almost level. It's just off level. It would be level if, this, if the street wasn't going uphill. So... Then we find these other divisions. Now again, hold your pencil to it. There's a jog in here. Uh, and then Notre Dame. Now the two towers there. I recommend don't draw, hi Carol, don't draw them individually. Draw the, you see it's almost a square at this point and then draw the separation between. And then we've got a, uh, something that comes forward of it. And then some foliage. Then there's some scaffolding back here. Um, tree, we'll get the crane in a little later. I like the way it ties back. So that shows me that I have to come down. Again, two angles. They're notice that they're not quite parallel. They're slightly converging. And I love the fact that some of these are this way, that way. So <laughs> it's just a... Uh, and disappears eventually into some figures and things back here. So I'm lightly drawing, we could draw a little darker as we go along. Hi, Judy. Ooh, even that's not. Let's 
think there's something coming down here too, isn't there? So, there's a figure here, and then we've got this. I think I need to bring that down. Uh, mansard roof, curve. Again, these uh, the lines within the building, lots of them. That's, it, don't be scared of this stuff. Do not be scared of this stuff. It's a box and the top is curved. <laughs> it's, you know, like a box you get from Amazon and the top is slightly curved. So start with the box that would be up here and then put the curve in. Now, these lines need to radiate like that. So, till they come to eye level. Actually, eye level here is almost the, the street up here where all that happens. Now, as the lines Go oh, here, they get a little closer together, even though they're probably evenly spaced. So it's like the railroad ties. Oops, come back. So just draw yourself some, and they get a little closer as you go back. Now our figures, can you fit the group into We got this one tall Spaniard here, a little bit of a slope to his shoulder, holding, everybody, everybody in this picture is holding onto their phones, a, or looking at them. Get it in. Ooh, I'm giving him way too big, aren't I? That's okay. I mean, if you draw it too big, then you're just getting the thing closer to you. The thing. The person. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, lady back here with a cowboy hat. This guy must have been very tall. Ah, Siri, how are you? And... Because even though typically if this is going uphill, which it is, everybody behind ought to have their headline above his headline, but his head was above everybody else's. So and uh and there's some miscellaneous people back there, but we don't draw them. We're gonna make them that's where the hints and the glints come in. And you see the hints and the glints by virtue of squints. You have to squint. You have to close one eye all together and close the other eye most of the way. And then what remains is a squint. Uh, or, you know, so let's, let's flesh out Notre Dame here. Two towers a little bit above it. Some kind of de decorative thing. There's the cross over here where the big round rose window was. And then there's whatever that building is in front. Don't, don't draw it to death. It's basically in silhouette. Um, what you're going to want to do is draw the things that are closer to you in more, slightly more detail if you're going to use any detail.
And this is going to be a big, big, glorious shadow. So. It's all shapes. Now there's the everywhere sign. There's some other tree back here. I love the way the uh, crane brings us right back over to Now there's some kind of, I don't know what it is, it's, it's like a, looks like the airfoil on one of those Fast and Furious cars or something. They all seem to have them. And again, it's not going to pay to draw the daylights out of this thing because there's a lot of what's going to happen in here is going to happen from the squints, glints, and the hints, the things that we're going to suggest by virtue. Uh, line up your windows. Uh, we Now, down here at street level, there are some uh, awnings. There's a bike lane. Um, and I think that's about as much, yeah, because a lot of this is, ah, uh, boy, I love these street lamps. Again, that's something I should paint. I just want to get my... Make it happen in the dark, with the darks. Shadow, I'm not gonna draw the shadows, I wanna see them painted. Take the street down a little lower. There's some kind of action, something here. Ah, miscellaneous stuff, it's gonna happen. when we paint. So let's call it the end of the pencils. Uh, next. So here's sort of a, an Apple Pencil sketch of how it works. I'm looking at this. You can see it's more or less one gigantic value. Um, I do want to get the value relationship between oops between the darks of all this the lights and the sky so ground plane sky plane vertical plane uh, those three-way relationship that's so important so if you squint that's very light it's about the same as the sidewalk this is a wee bit darker overall all of this drops in together and if I had to say, it's a tough call between what's darker, the road and the sidewalk or the sky. And I'm going to say that the road and the sidewalk are ever so slightly darker. Um, yeah, so hopefully they get, and you see what I did. I basically banged in this big, dark pizza wedge there and a chewed on wedge of pizza over here. And then I took the erase function on the pencil and picked out little highlights, glints 
hints that make it look like there's people walking down the street, hopefully. Um, back to that. So what do we got to do? I've got a sky that's transitioning from a blue to a pale ochre kind of color. Then there's some sort of brownish, grayish, greenish, gray violetish ness in this area. So I know that since all of this is going to be mostly darker except for that and maybe that if I can remember not to hit it. <laughs> um, uh, I'll just change from a blue to a yellow ochre. We'll do the runny mix beaded wash. Change up to a more nondescript brownish lavender um, this is where the dirty palette comes in. It's those palette. It's kind of like the once you've sautéed onions or something, and then you deglaze it with with uh, white wine or something. Uh, you pick up all that, and it, and it harmonizes nicely. So for the main wash, I'm going to use a big brush, a mop brush, and I need to mix up some yellow ochre for the lower portion of the sky. And it's gonna be very runny. And I'm not gonna need much of this. I'm gonna have that ready to go and begin to modify it to get the other light colors, which will be, maybe I'll put in some red iron oxide um, or some alizarin to make it redder, a little bluer maybe to make it more violet. So here's my runny mix of, and I don't need much of it, of yellow ochre. Pale, runny. See it collect down there. If it runs fast, it's going to be pale. If it runs a little slower, it still forms a puddle, it's going to be light medium. If it runs slowly and doesn't quite make a puddle, closer to medium. If it doesn't move, it's going to be medium to dark. Now, rinse that, get all the yellow out. In here, I'm going to get some cerulean blue. And we don't have to worry about getting anything into these other shapes because they're darker. And even if you get a little bluishness in there, there's some bluishness to it. So again, a maybe a little denser than uh, what I mixed for the yellow ochre. So I got a 11 by 15 piece of Saunders Waterford uh, cold press. Uh, it's table is about a 45 degree angle. To facilitate the washes going, the beaded washes going down there. So, breathe deeply. Whoops, let's see, wait a minute. <laughs> Erase any lines that you think might be something you don't want, like this area between the towers of Notre Dame, any construction lines, but that's dark. If it's in a dark area, it's probably not gonna matter. Alrighty. I think that's enough. Okay, here we go. Ah, John, you never make enough. Let's put a little ultramarine in there too. Always have plenty because you're gonna mod you can easily modify this later, so it doesn't matter if you get a ton of it. You can use it to mix the colors that we use up here. So load the brush from the side by laying it in the puddle. Um, don't load it from the tip because you'll only 
load the tip. You want to load the whole, whole brush here. So coming sideways, getting a bead going. I can already tell that's not dark enough. Get a little more pigment in there. Get a good mix, John. Okay. Good bead going there. Oh, look at that. See? Now, when I got a bead like this, I can just pick up underneath and grab it. Because it's pregnant. I don't know if that's the right word here. It just it wants to go. I'm going to put a little more in at the top while it's wet. There's water still on the surface. So it's, you see how it shears down and just feeds the bead. Now, at this point, I'm rinsing that brush good. The bead is waiting for me. Rinsing it good, and now I'm going to the yellow ochre. This is a little above where I want that to happen, but because it's shearing down, it's going to finish up a little lower down. Okay. I can even tip the board to get the blue to go even further. Now at this point, hey, look at that. We don't worry about that. There's going to be a tree there. I'm putting some of this blue into this yellow ochre. I'm getting a little bit of red iron oxide or burn umber. Either one will do. I'm getting a more nondescript brownish greenish color. Let's get a little more of the umber. Right across the figures, all the detail in the figures is going to come out with little whites and stuff. So I've got the board at a more than <laughs> uh, 45 degree angle there for the moment. Now, putting some more blue in there, maybe a little bit of alizarin. Coming across, picking up the bead. Let's get more blue. Let's go right into this puddle of blue, a little bit of alizarin. Some of the brown. Nondescript urban colors. We're probably going to glaze more particular versions of these colors on there. Let's get a little more red and a little more blue in it. Now there's not a lot of pressure on the brush. See, I'm picking up the bead and I'm laying it on sideways. I'm going to get some of this up here. Maybe a little more blue, a little more alizarin. Yeah, I like the alizarin. More blue. Picking up under that bead and letting it come down. Now, as it collects at the bottom, it looks like a mess at the moment. It should. Hi, Shelly. Rinsing that brush good. Probably going to go to a smaller brush at this point. Um, I'm going to wait a second, and as the glint goes, well, the glint goes off. Uh, no, just, <laughs> I'm going to get a small, here, here's the mop brush I used. Here's the mop brush I'm going to switch to, a little smaller. This one's a synthetic squirrel, this one's a real squirrel. And if you're in a splurgy mood, it's worth getting them. They just, uh, these drive like a pretty good car. Uh, you know, these drive like a nice 
$30,000 car. These drive like a $60,000 car. Um, they're just fun to use. So I'm going to dry this for the sake of the... So cover your ears. Okay, I think we're good. Um, I touched it and felt it and nothing feels cool. So that means, well, it's a little bit cool there. That's okay, that's gonna be a tree. You can see where that drizzle came. It's no biggie, because there's gonna be a tree there. Something dark is gonna go over that. Um, and it, I think we're just pretty good. We're starting to get our lightning, lightening <laughs> right around that area. So let's talk about uh, when you're, ooh, we're getting to the complicated stuff. I'm starting to get scared, you know. What are we going to do? Again, first thing we do is breathe deeply and squint. And you notice, look at that big, huge, dark shape. I really only kind of have to miss that. And, oh, maybe that. And even if I don't, I can probably come back and lift it out. Um, First pass, maybe we'll go about this dark or a little darker, and there will be subsequent glazes. Okay, and a glaze, if, if I haven't mentioned it recently, is when you put a runny mix of paint on top of a, another layer of paint that is thoroughly dry so that the two work together and create a third color. So, what are we going to make now? Slower moving darker paint. One of the fun things you can do with these silhouettes is, so this is going to be slower moving paint. You can do the, you can play with colors that separate. And the best way to get some color separation is to use something from the blue or violet end of the, of the spectrum blue, green, violet in the spectrum, and something from the red, orange, yellow end of the uh, spectrum. You don't need to use all of them, uh, just so that the two colors have some, not only separation of hue, but some separation of, uh, I hate to say warm and cool, because that's, <laughs> but there's a difference there. So I'm going to start out with a Quinacridone Sienna uh, Ultramarine Blue Mix. And one of the fun things you can do is you can use a little more of the one at one end and a little more of the other at the... I should explain that better. You can... <laughs> Kilted squeegee. Oh, I like that. Hello. Um... You could use your bluer, uh, grayer shades towards the back to uh, suggest some spatial recession. And you could use your slightly more vivid or red or orangier colors towards the front to uh, suggest an advance. So this will not be the darkest mix that I do. And I'm gonna modify this mix. So you can see there's a slight greenish quality to that. Um, mm, I, that quinacridone sienna, blue sees it and, and, and make a little bit of green come out of it. 
So as I move back into space, I might begin working a little more blue or maybe another blue into it. So how am I gonna do this? Let's look for disguise points or uh, stopping points or uh, call them Thermopylae's. Um, you can see we're getting narrow here and there's a lot of much darker information. So that's a place I could kind of stop. I could execute this area back here. Uh, well, um, if I need to get particular and do any work down here if, if it needs extra, I then I can switch over to here, come across here and come down and get the figures. So I always look for those, I call them choke points, thermopylies, uh, little thin areas like that where if I do run out of paint, have to mix more or, you know, uh, I'm having to get over here and paint a complicated shape, um, I can do it and disguise the, the break in all that busyness. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, this, the lower portion And this will not be see I painted over that thing there. That's okay. I'll come back and I'll lift it. Maybe I'll add a little more blue, a little bit of the sienna. Uh, the color you can see them separating here. While the surface is wet, I can get away with uh, adding, modifying, getting on the tip, drawing. So here we go, I'm painting over that figure because she is fundamentally darker than anything going on around her. Come across. Okay. I'm going to put a little bit of cerulean into that mix to get it bluer and less brown. And then I'm going to execute. So I got a stopping point here, see? Um, heck, let's just get the guy. I remember, I remember when I saw him, he stood out because he was tall and he's kind of regal looking. I mean, he looked like a Spanish nobleman or something that Velasquez would paint. And let's get a little bit of shadow off these people. I mean, he just had that look, you know? other figure back here. She's going to have a white hat, but we're going to put that in later. Leave some little skips. Uh, let's... Now, see, I went back and got that made it a little darker. It doesn't matter if it bleeds because there's going to be a very dark passage in there. More cerulean, maybe a little turquoise. Ah, Carol, good question. I can get a blossom if the paint that I bring in is too runny. Anything I bring into a wet area, one, there needs to be some water on the surface, and two, the paint that I'm bringing in needs to be denser in other words, more pigment than what's there already. Try to leave a light spot there. Let's get a little more bluish to get Notre Dame. But that's a very good question. 
It's all about the consistency. If you bring something runny into something runny, you're going to get a blossom. So you need to bring the thicker paint. See, here's, here's the $60,000 car quality of a squirrel brush as opposed to a Uh, faux squirrel, imitation squirrel. I can get up on that point and do all these fun little things. Yeah, you can see here I'm getting a bit of a blossom. Uh, going back here, as the brush exhausts, there's less paint on it, I'm going to get that tree. That's back at the, uh, the intersection here is the Pont Saint-Michel. Now, I'm going to get a little, maybe a little more water into this mix. Uh, let's actually bluer and a little bit of a lizard and purplier. This series of things on the roof here. Try to get that characteristic curve of the mansard. Not leaving. So here's that choke point where I can, I'm going to start working in a little bit of the either burn umber or Quinacridone Sienna. I don't know what the two materials are that they use on the side of the building versus whatever they roof it with. There's the arrow air sign. See, so maybe if I'm careful, I can leave some highlights on the figure's head there. I'll let that come down into there. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little bit of turquoise into that. Here I'm working off a wet edge. Um, Maybe I'll leave some little skips or highlights in there for the business that's going on in the road. Touch some of this into the tree colors and I'm wanting to get a blossom there because it'd be nice to get some texture on something that's supposed to be foliage. But now this is it's a little too dry over there. Okay, remember we're suggesting. Now rinse that. Probably want a smaller brush, something stiffer. Uh nearly as big, but it's the oriental brush, so there's probably one fifth the number of hairs in this as there is in that. So it's not going to hold as much. So there are one fifth the number of capillary spaces <laughs> to hold paint. So it's, it's because it's stiffer, it's good for holding more paint. Um, I mean, denser paint, but because it's fewer hairs, it, it will not hold as much paint. So I can be, I don't have to feel as uncontrolled or whatever. Um, yeah, let's go back to the big one because we get a big space. Uh, I can go here now. There's a kind of a cool 
sprucey green color here. I'm going to get a little bit of Prussian. Because that's a blue that le uh, leans green. Uh, a little bit of the quinacridone sienna. You can see that makes quite a green. So there's a tinge of yellowishness in the sienna. And there's a tinge of greenishness in this blue. So when the two of them get together, uh, we get a distinctly green color. But it's not... It's not a, uh, well, let's throw in some cerulean even. It's not a uh, vibrant blue-green. So hopefully you can see that we're starting to get something that's looking like uh, that street in Paris. So again, from here, won't be the last uh, color I drop in. And I might skip my figure here. Come down. So that squirrel, it holds a ton of paint because of the fine hair. Um, but because of the elasticity of the natural hair, I can go from laying on the side of the brush, delivering a lot of paint, to uh, getting up on the tip, the tip will be recovered. Look at that, how sharp that is. And uh, go into an area that requires a bit more definition. And a natural hair just quite ain't going to do that. But they're getting better. I got to give them that. They are getting better. So I'm going to go for a more brownish mix right here just for a little bit of, again, suggesting hints, glints, and squints that more is going on in the foreground than goes on in the background. So other things we can do, there's water on that surface we can dip straight into, uh, like say indigo or Prussian and some red to get like a deep, Violety color, lizard edges, um, a deep bluish violet. Very dark here. Now, this is very dense, slow moving paint. So, when I put this in to this wet surface, it's not going to go very far. Now, I really need to make it dense now. So if I were to tip this palette up, it's not going anywhere, you see? That is why we can get away. See, I put that mark there and it sort of softens, but it's not going very far. So, and because water runs downhill, I know well, I can see the glisten. That's going to be very damp. Have to get ultra, ultra, ultra dark here. So we're starting to get some separation here between our Buchanists. So we can actually get into some detail there. Um, same stuff. Uh, ooh. I'm going to rinse that brush out. 
put it aside because I'm going to be working in a smaller area, so I'm going to get to that guy. Rinse it, blot it, so I'm not bringing water to this mix. Well, I guess I'm going to need more, aren't I? <laughs> Back there, these darks and, and our Spanish nobleman. Now, I'm going to need a little bit of water. I'm just squinting and, and painting abstract spots and shapes, hints and glints. I'm suggesting stuff. I, you'd never want to, in a painting, render something that far away to the extent you're going to render something up here. Uh, well, one thing we do have to do whatever that thing is. And we'll make more of that perhaps a little later. Um, okay, concentrate, John, don't get lost, find. <laughs> I'm as bad as anybody. So I'm using the Lizarin in Prussian to make a off violet. What do I see? What do I see? You see something triangular, make it triangular. If you see something funnel shaped, make it funnel shaped. If you see something Like an H or an R or a <laughs> whatever you think you see, make it that. Just put a little bit of cerulean into that, same consistency, different hue. Um, cowgirl's pants. Uh, this young lady had pants that color too. She does need to be darker. She had a dark top. He needs to be quite dark. Prussian, cad red light, or the equivalent, or cad, you know, something like that. Uh, I'm going to put a little more blue. He had black pants, but I'm going to make them a little bluer so it's not the same top to bottom. Person back there. Suggestion of a person back here. Um, rinse it. Blot it. Hi, Leah. Hello, Cecile. How are you? I'm getting some cad red, maybe some quinacridone sienna for a very dark reddish brownish kind of color. I'm going to melt that into the area of his face. He is backlit and perhaps his hands here. This girl's face, this lady's face, maybe some faces back here. Um, Caucasian flesh is surprisingly dark. Backlit in the sunlight. Um, let's see. Oh, rinse, blot, some red. While it's still oh, damp there, I'll get a soft edge. Let's fool with, now at this point, I'm working all over the picture. Um, speaking of Galesburg, <laughs> uh, 
Um, give this a second to dry, and I can. I can um, this sort of subject it doesn't have to be Paris. It could be uh, Paris on the Seine, Canton on the Mississippi. There's Galesburg at the railroad station, the Amtrak station. And here's like downtown Chicago. You just see that big silhouette shape. Uh, what I'm doing now with the figures, it's exactly what I would be doing here. The blue and the color, this sidewalk would have gone in first and these darks and then darker darks and then so on. So, you know, and, and, and here there would have been more reds and things and, uh, Big wedges, <laughs> same thing. It's kind of fun. Um, watercolor likes this sort of uh, approach. So now I'm gonna make a greenish color. I'm gonna get a little bit of cad yellow. Not a zippy green, I want a sort of a dull green. So I'm mixing it into this. Uh, This is one of those things, or the tree that I'm painting now. If you look into that, you're going to see, oh, thanks, Cecile. You're going to see all kinds of darks and lights and you will, if you're only looking at that, you will make the mistake of losing the overall value of that within the entire scene. So if you squint, see how that just, all of it, even the lightest parts, drop in. And if you paint it too light and too sparkly, it's going to compete with this. This has to jump out. These have to actually even go a little darker. The street has to go a little darker. Um, we're going to do that. But right now I'm putting some green in, greenishness. And one of the reasons I underpainted that in the first color pass that we went through is that sort of prevents me from getting lost in mixing this green and that green and doing all these different things and getting something that sticks out a little bit too much. So a bluer green, I'm actually going to just go for some turquoise in there because this tree is farther away. It's on the other side of the bridge. Um, that was fun. I went over and set up on the bridge and painted Notre Dame that day. And sort of fun because there's like a little bike lane <laughs> and a pedestrian lane and in the middle the, the vehicle lane. And I had to have the easel pushed all the way up against the railing of the bridge and the leg hanging over and holding on to it and not backing up because I didn't want to get run over by a bicycle or bump a pedestrian or <laughs> it's uh that's the painting in your uh, dining room Carol ah yes Michael make a good point um they're drawing a little bit lighter another thing I should have mentioned this. Thank you for bringing that up, Michael. Um, I am painting, say, for example, the, you'll notice this is a lot lighter than that, and this is going to look a lot lighter than that. I have dropped them down just a bit, I'm, or I've lightened them up just a bit, so that I don't have to go for like almost a pure black for the buildings. I want to have a little bit of headroom, so to speak, so that I can create, uh, rather than a hard silhouette like that, uh, which is just basically working with black on a gray surface and erasing the highlights. I want to be able to, you have some fudge room, um, but when you've got a big silhouette, you want to make sure that you don't take the things that are the darkest and maybe have to make them all the way black because black will not, it's great for accents. 
you know, and strong area, dark areas like that. But uh, in a big shape, it can get a little bit unwieldy. Um, so let's take that Prussian. Let's throw in a little bit of the red, make a very dark, deep, well, to you, it's probably going to look bluish, um, a violet. And start, you know, getting some of these strong, strong darks. Uh, some kind of locking mechanism there. Um, So see that dark there? Um, that gives me, this is almost black, it's a bluish black, but that gives me the headroom that I need to uh, not have it turn into a monochrome. A little bit of air, extra on him, perhaps a little bit more here. Um, let's get a lighter dark by putting some water in it. Carefully see if we can suggest the windows in Notre Dame. The front of that other portion of it. Some other things back there. So hopefully it looks like, uh, it's starting to look like, I'm going to darken that up. It's strictly hints. I'm hinting at this sort of thing. Uh, let's get a lot of just everything, nondescript dark. Um, there are some darker portions on the top of the roof here. Now there's detail all down the side of the building. What we want to do is be careful that we keep most of that sort of detail around here and just start losing it as we go back there. Um, now, there's a panel in here that is panel, a facade that I would say is a little bit darker. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say. A little bit of water with this, and I'm going to... Leave a lighter portion on the top. Down that side. Switch to a browner mix. Here's the glazing. That surface is dry. Oh, we'll come all the way down. Kind of get the dark stuff. So, <laughs> I'm getting in the corners here. I call it the fond. Uh, coming up underneath this wet edge and touching in, I do want to get a bit of a blossom now. Uh, the sides of these, I, they're not dormers, I believe they're chimney things. Uh, uh, collectors for multiple chimneys from multiple apartments or something. I'd love to get in there and see what the insides of those buildings are like. So again, I want to make sure I'm not overdoing it 
keep the detail towards the front. Uh, let's let that set up. Where else can we work? Um, well, let's get some, something like that for Vicky. Hello, how are you? Uh, th this brush is nice. It's stiff. And if I squeeze it, I get a flat edge if I go like that and a thin edge if I go like that. So for stuff like this, like the crane, be suggestive. It's back there away, the scaffolding. The other cranes. There are some stoplights. We can get a little bit darker. Ultramarine and Burn Umber makes a good dark. They're verticals. And you want to be mindful of where you're placing them. some sort of railing or balcony arrangement. So because that surface is wet and I'm putting a slower moving paint into it, I'm getting a, it more or less stays put, but it bleeds out and softens. And hopefully, fingers crossed, will look like something further away. So I need to let that dry. Let's see, where else can I work with this? I've got that marvelous light. So this is the sort of thing I might not put exactly where it is. intervals of spatial intervals I want to uh, do to my liking. I'll make that a little longer like that. I think I'm going to at this point dry this. Um, gee whiz, this, oh, well it's dark. I just, that just needs to be darker. As does that, darker and browner. So it's wet and we can get away with this. I'm bringing in paint that is nearly the same consistency, just a wee bit less runny. Let's dry this and put our finishing marks on it. Our finishing glazes. Donald, hello. that noise. Now, the final marks will be, we're going to glaze the tops of these to get them a little closer to the value I want and maybe leave a little 
specks and lights and stuff to get the texture, uh, create that. We're going to glaze the sidewalk and the road and leave a little bit of the existing color behind to possibly mimic that sort of stuff. Um, so first the glazes. Um, just in a mop, use something that will carry a lot of water is usually the best. Uh, let's just use what we've been using. I need a greenish glaze, so some blues, some browns, some nondescript. colors. This one's a little lighter than those. Very kind of light touch, trying to leave a little bit of the original color behind. Now, a little bit bluer and a wee bit darker. For this bunch. Yep, that's a little closer to what I was looking for. Maybe even throw a bit of that in well, that's what, now, there you go. There's Runny into Runny, Carol. Hi, Roxanne. Um, so you can see it's, because there's a lot of water on the surface, it's just, it's basically still enough there that it's gonna disappear into that. And it'll look like, I hope, uh, weathered <laughs> paint, that sort of thing. Um, let's mix up a kind of purplish, get some of that blue, it's a little too purple, let's get some turquoise in there, or ultramarine, or cerulean, I want a pale lavender. Now I'm going to try to carefully, oh, let's get with the darker, huh? Leave a little bit of the original. Uh, soft hair brush on a glaze. You don't want to, if you can avoid it, loosen up something that you previously painted. Now let's put a little more of a blue and some red into the front of that. Okay, it's soft touch, soft brush. If you use a stiff brush and a lot of uh, force, you're going to lift what you've painted previously, and we don't. We want to kind of avoid that if we can. Let's get a smaller brush since it's a smaller area. Yeah, see, it loosened up my shadows. They don't look shadowy now, but we'll fix that. Um, a bluer gray, brown, cerulean, somewhat runny. Almost. Oh, I like that color, and I am going to suggest 
some of these windows. There, oh my goodness, there's smaller and closer together as they go back. Not too much detail to the. Oh, good, Carol. It must be like a dozen floors in these buildings. Okay, that's about as crazy as we need to get or should get. There, there's some sort of thing there. Should have dried the daylights out of that. Okay. Okay. There's the hints. Very deep, rich purple. In there. Uh, I think the faces need to be a little... Let's actually get some orange. A little more... Okay, now for the, the glints. Get something very small, uh, like a nylon. Hello, Richard. The, oh, dry everything, John. Be safe, dry everything. Get the white, which is frowned on, but I don't care, right into the nozzle. And let's get the glints on the top of his shoulders and his head, a little bit coming down there. Top and back of her head. She had a pony. I can see I need to make her some people further back. There's some just I squint. The lights on the, gosh, you can't even really see these things. Be mindful of where you're putting them. Don't get them too busy. There's a piece of, something fell on the street. Uh, intervals, mind your intervals. I'm going to mix it with the orange to get a, tannish kind of color. This, well, it should be darker than that, shouldn't it? Or is it his hands there? I think I will 
use some of that with some of this blue to get a sort of a tan to get a, there's some little things like that. This girl, yeah, I need that color for her arms. And I need like a lavender, this Holbein lavender for her top. Well, she has a black top, but that's not going to stand out against the, uh, somebody back there. Let's just splatter a bit. Well, thank you, Shai. I'm gonna... Well, the little effort, the reason why it's a little effort is I am to the greatest extent I possibly can letting the water do some work for me. Um, rather than stroking and stroking and stroking and so that these little marks like this, uh, they're not, you know, they're just, anybody could do those, really, seriously. Um, you don't need a lot of dexterity to, <laughs> to paint this sort of stuff. So I'm looking at this and this funny guy, he needs some, uh, his hair is weird. Really was the most striking guy. I need some dark to finish off the... I'm using my pinky as a mall stick. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a red umbrella, but I don't want to... Well, shoot. I'm going to be careful with this sort of stuff. There were some traffic lights there. Let's get a runnier, less dark mix and... In our windows. We could. I did put some red in here to make it a, a awning. Let's see if we can spruce that up a bit, but we don't want to call too much attention there when we're trying to keep it out here. And I think I'm going to use just a wee bit of the white right out of the tube. Oh, Shelly, we all need more patience, don't we? She had some kind of cowboy hat kind of thing. And the girl's hair needs to be dark, and that'll be it. And we'll detape and see what the damage is. Indigo, burn umber, indigo, burn umber, dark. Okay, looking at her phone. Oh, I don't care about the Washington Post. Okay, that's, that's more detail than that. Thank you, Becky. More detail than that 
bigger picture. Give yourself the swinging room. When you start packing tons of detail into a quarter sheet, 11 by 15, it just isn't going to work. It'll be too busy. And this is something, our strong silhouette is the thing that will carry it from across the room uh, with the other pictures. The shape, um, I mean, my goodness, the, the fashion industry has known this forever. It's a strong silhouette, an interesting shape. Um, that's what carries things. Okay. So there we go. Paris. And I hope so. Let's, uh, he sees stuff. <laughs> the, uh, whatever this thing was there. I'm, I'm not bothering with car. There's some cars there, like a Prius or something. I'm not going to paint something like that, that far back, that close to the... edge of the painting. Okay, so let's review. It's a strong silhouette. And within that are hints and glints and just uh, smaller value changes uh, and more dramatic value changes, um, which suggest to us all this stuff and junk uh, that's going on in a contre jour backlit situation. I will probably later, when the paint is much drier, try to lift out that little thing there. That's a nice place for a light to happen. And an easy way to do that to get a very uh, specific shape is to, when it's bone dry, mask out the shape with tape and then get a brush, a stiffer brush that's like, you know, something like this, a stiff nylon brush. And then with very clean water, loosen it up blot it, let it dry, peel the tape away, and you'll have that shape. Um, it's a good way to get a skinny light edge, too, to lift. Uh, you could put two pieces of tape very close together and then just rub between them uh, with clean water, blot it, and then you can get a, a, a nice skinny shape. Uh, I could probably, like, tighten that up, but do I want to tighten that up? It's not the key, the main thing, but the main thing, the main thing. If you don't have, when you're backlit, color takes back seat and shape becomes the important thing, but that doesn't mean you can't do fun things with the color. Thank you, Carol. You can, thank you, Michael. You can still have those separations of color between a something from the blue green purple end of the spectrum and some or in a mix it with something from the red orange yellow end of the spectrum and um, avoid the trap of painting these things too many dark light and medium by seeing that whole large silhouette and then you know, paint that, then tint it with a little bit of green because it's not going to be a strong green. If you look right over here all by itself, your eye will run out there and it will see four shades of green, five shades of green, um, lights, darks, mediums. But when you're looking at the whole scene, it's something different. Um, that takes a lot of getting used to. It really does. I, I will admit that. It took me years. Um, 
just not look. It's, it's, I know it sounds counterintuitive. You have to look at something to see what it is to paint it. But um, we have to remember as painters, we have to look at the entire scene we are painting and paint that. So, oh, maybe just a... Then once you get some wholeness to it, then you can go back and find all these fun little things like that or... Uh, oh, good, good grief. I mean, all the little weird things that you can... Uh, I think I think my crane needs to be a titch darker, neutral. Start particularly around the ballast and the that area there. But I hopefully that gets the idea across. Um, Big silhouette. Uh, find those choke points, those disguise points, uh, where you can, uh, you don't have to feel like ah, uh, white knuckle painting, that kind of thing. And uh, usually it's a narrow area. You can stop and paint that. Like plan it out ahead of time. This is going to be executed before. You could execute that separately, that separately. Uh, this initially happened with the first washes and then it was glazed later. This initially happened with the first washes, glazed later. Um, and then the little marks, the hints and the, the glints. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. I had fun painting that. Um, it's Boy, Paris is a wonderful place to paint as a subject and certainly as a uh, to be there painting on location. So everyone stay safe, stay sane. Thankfully, it's getting warmer and I'll see you all next week. Bye bye.